the place to go to detect the root case? Yeah. Oh, um, I, da I downloaded it on my and computer. If you search um, Sony and Rootkit, you'll and in the news rather than just the web, you'll get the hit pretty quickly for uh, where to go to find something or remove it, and that should be the site in question.
A notice on the packet I'm not showing here is uh, ICMP, Internet Control Messaging Protocol, which is used for exchanging information between hosts on the internet about various problems that might be happening, like if a service or if a particular host is unreachable. Now, a few different port ranges I want to make you familiar with. There's 65,534 different ports. That's because each port is represented as the 16 bit section of those headers. All the ones between 0 and 1023 on a Unix based operating system, you're going to have to have root privileges to be able to use those. In Windows, as I recall, you do not need to be an admin to use them, but uh, if you're using XP Service Pack 2 and you have the firewall enabled, it will probably ask you if you open up any ports in your machine to listen. And you'll have to be an admin to open them up. Or possibly power users might be good as well. I haven't actually checked up on that. This range are registered ports. ICANN maintains a list of what's commonly associated with these different ports. And these are private or dynamic ports. Usually you're not going to find well-known services on there, but you will from time to time. Most of the time, people follow the standards on what listens on what port. Like most people are going to have SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, listening on port 25. They're going to have the web data, like Apache or IIS, listening on port 80. But you don't have to have it that way. You can have it set up entirely different. If you wanted to, you could have people doing their email over port 80. However, they'd have to specify the port. Have you ever seen a URL with um, a colon and a number on the end? Like you might see www.igeek.com colon 52. Well, that particular colon is telling your web browser what port to try to connect to the service, the web service on that main machine is. Um, sometimes you can actually use under weird circumstances, a web browser to port scan, because you can specify a port and see what response you get back to your web browser. However, generally, we do that in Telnet, and I'm going to show you how to use Telnet to do just that here in a bit. Now, when you're doing a port scan, TCP and UDP differ a little bit in how you can tell whether our port's open. <coughs> and I have to thank uh, Fedor who created InMap for this. I actually uh, use this book for this reference. He's got a book that's hopefully be coming out in a few months, maybe a year, that is going to go into great detail about port scanning in general and in that specifically. You get back a TCP reset response, you know it's unfiltered, but more than likely closed. No response received means it's filtered. A lot of times when the firewall is configured to block certain ports, what they do is instead of giving you any message back at all, this will say anything. <coughs> Sometimes this is also listed as stealth on some of the websites I'll show you in a bit. If you get an ICMP unreachable error, any of these error codes, it's listed as filtered. Okay. Overall, thank you. Actually, I want to say it might be closed or filtered. I may have that wrong. On a UDP scan, there's no reset packets, no send packets, none of that, because it's stateless. It's basically fire and forget. So you have to rely completely on ICMP. And sometimes when you're using UDP packets, depending on what service you're trying to connect to, you may not get a response back at all. That might not mean anything. <coughs> sure, we'll do that. Any UDP, sorry, any UDP response from the target at all usually means it's open. If you get anything back after you send a UDP packet to it, it's probably responding to what you sent. If you get no response at all, it could be open, depending on the protocol, or it could be filtered by a firewall as such. If you get these particular ICM uh, messages, it probably means it's closed, and these particular ones means it's filtered by a firewall. Let me switch to a flash presentation to give you a better idea. These are Shockwave flash presentations I did for my website. They have audio and everything. Here's those different types of flags I told you about in TCP packets. The send, at, reset, thin, push, urge, and what they all mean. Sometimes you also might have these packets. I really am not familiar with the use of them. These are the common packets you should be aware of, though.
Now, the way a program like InMap finds out whether or not a particular port is open is the first thing it's going to do is send a SYN packet. Are you familiar with the three-way handshake in TCP? SYN, SYN acknowledge, acknowledge. Well, let's say we have SYN scan on an open port. What InMap will do is just send a SYN. If it gets back a SYN acknowledge, it'll send back a reset packet saying, oh, okay, tear down the connection, I know your port's open. The reason it does a SYN scan, well, let me first of all go with the full connect. I'm sorry, I'm jumping around here. I don't give lectures very often. A full TCP connect scan, you actually send a SYN, it sends back a SYN acknowledge, you send back an acknowledge, and then later on you go tear down the connection. That's a full connect scan. That's actually going to be handed all the way up the TCP, TCP IP stack to the application. There's reasons you don't want to do this. Back in the olden days, of course, this would leave, a, leave something in the log file. So to be more stealthy, you use SIN scans. Since you never actually do the complete freeway handshake with the SIN scan, because all you need to do is get back the SIN acknowledge to know that the port's open. Since you don't go do the complete freeway handshake, it doesn't get logged. That's not true anymore because most IDSs will log that, most firewalls will log that, even the Ranky Dang firewall that comes with XP Service Pack 2 will log it. Also, another good reason for doing a SIN scan instead of a full connect scan, since it doesn't complete the freeway handshake, it doesn't get handed up the protocol layers, so it's less likely to cause um, an application to crash because it never gets handed to the application. The operating system itself hopefully take care of tear down the connection and seeing as invalid. By the way, feel free to ask a question at any time. Now in the case of the port was closed, you send a SIN to it and you get back a reset message, like this bottom example, that means that particular port is closed. If you got back no message at all, it probably needs to be filled up by a firewall. However, you could configure a firewall conceivably to give back no to give back a reset message instead. In which case, in that report closed, even though it's actually filtered by a firewall. All that makes sense so far? Okay. Now, to give you an example of uh, doing a port scan by hand, I'm actually going to follow along and do this. I'm going to drop out to a command line here. <coughs> specify telnet, what port to connect to, <coughs> just type the number at the end. Now I failed to connect, so I know that port's probably closed. Now let's say I connected to port 80 instead. Well, I didn't get back an instant close, so that port seems to be open. Now I can do something called a banner grab. What a banner grab is, is whenever you try to send a response to it, to get more information. And hopefully, someplace in the header, or in the banner that you get back, it'll give you information about the particular version of the service that's running there. InMap and other port scanners have whole databases of different responses built in so they can tell what particular service you're talking to. Now, I did this on a web server. And if you notice at the very top, and I know it's now an Apache box. And I know a couple of the mods that are running. And that can be very useful information since I have, no, it's an Apache box, or at least I figure it's an Apache box. It's possibly it could be lying to us. You can recompile the source or edit a config file to change this. But it's more likely an Apache box. I know the version number, so now I can go to some place like security focus, look for a particular vulnerability for that particular version number, and then possibly export the box and get in. Yay! I think I this. Now, a few of the tools I want to mention. <coughs> I just showed you how to do a port scan by hand. But would you really want to sit there and scan all 65,000 some odd ports and tell that by <coughs> hand? Probably not. But there's some really good tools out there for doing it. 
The first one I want to mention is the auto to boot CD. All the Unix tools I'll be mentioning all come on the auto to boot CD. Download from the website, and that should be on your notes. Don't use it at school. Use it in your home network. Everybody has a home network, right? Good. Use it in your home network to play around with some of these tools. The name of security tool, it pretty much has it on that CD. Just like burn it using Nero or whatever CD image burning software you use and uh, boot from it and you're good to go. If you got one of the Dells, usually it's like F12 to tell it what you want to boot from. If you don't have a Dell and it's in the machine, you might have to get in the BIOS and specify what boot the media to use. In that, which is my favorite personal port scanner, it's been around for quite a while, has so many different features built into it. I'm only going to show a few tonight because this is just an intro. If you're more, if you're curious about EMAP, do a couple Google searches for it. And on the Bound Geek website, I have uh, two tutorials to use EMAP to go into some of the more advanced topics. There's Angry IP, which I personally have not gotten to work recently. I think it's because uh, XP Service Pack 2 has kind of screwed it up. There's SuperScan. SuperScan is made by Foundstone. A couple of guys from Foundstone write a few of the Hacking Exposed books. By the way, we have a fairly good section of computer security books in the library here, and a few CDs we got from uh, some department of the NSA for teaching computer security. <coughs> so you might be interested in checking those out. Super Scandal, like I said, was made by Foundstone. As far as Windows only uh, port scanners, it's pretty good. The one problem is with Service Pack 2, you <coughs> can no longer do the send scan, and I'll explain why here in a bit. The scan man, which, while well, I still like in that better, ScanMap has some great functionality if you want to do a scan incredibly fast. The way it does it, it does it stateless. What it'll do is it'll fire off a bunch of packets, asking for it to open, and that process does nothing but fire off packets. The different process listens for any packets that come back and figures out what's what and tells you what these ports are open. Since it's stateless, it can scan like class B subnets incredibly quickly. And I'll illustrate using ScanMan here in a bit. HPing I'm not actually going to show, but if you want to get nitty gritty and construct a weird packet, like all possible flags set to be on, or you know, this individual pick and choose flags to sent on and see how a machine responds, I recommend HPing. The uh, results you get back from it though are not as user friendly, and I'm to be honest with you, I'm not as familiar with it as I am the other tools. All these calling cards? Everything leaves a calling card if you look hard enough. All of these will leave a calling card, even in something like a Service Pack 2's uh, firewall. And actually, I'll show a little bit about what kind of uh, message you get in the firewall logs if you use in that using various flags. Okay, my almost live demonstration. If you want to see what these applications look like, I have a little security test lab over in my office. So currently, I'm controlling the machine in there. Here's what angry IP scanner looks like. You basically input the IP range you want to use, what ports, you can start scanning. You'll get back all sorts of information about those. Like for instance, in my case, I'm going to use 2192.168.1.100 to let's say 125. And what it's doing is it's pinging them first to make sure they're up. In some cases, you want to disable the ping functionality because some people will not listen for ping is, uh, I believe, ICMP uh, message 7 echo request. Uh, not all machines are going to respond to that. So sometimes you can actually port scan a box that's not, not giving back a ping request. But this is least telling me what, which one of those boxes is up. However, something is screwing it up for me with an angry IP and it's not giving me the ports. Also, since I'm on the same LAN as it, it's giving me back what MAC address that machine is using. <coughs> You've all gone over MAC addresses, right? Now, as you can see, I'm not exactly getting the results I want from an angry IP scanner. So I'm going to use SuperScan. And I'm going to put it in a similar range. <coughs> the 
it over there. And let's see. Right now, <coughs> by default, it's set to use a send scan, as you can see right here. If you just send the send packet, and if it gets back a send acknowledge, it says, okay, don't need to know anymore, and it closes the connection. Here's something that Service Pack 2 did. And I'm going to start the scan to illustrate this. Let me share that. One of the things that Service Pack 2 did that screwed things up is they killed raw socket support. Raw socket basically meant you didn't have to use the operating system's IP stack in total. You could actually say just in a send packet or just an acknowledge packet. Now you have to do the freeway handshake. There might be a patch there so you can get back support for raw sockets in XP Service Pack 2. I haven't really looked into it that closely. I just use Linux. But because they killed a raw socket support, you can't do a SIN scan directly in XP Service Pack 2. Like you will notice in here, the only port we're getting any information on is a UDP port. Because it couldn't just do a raw SIN scan. All geology are UDP ports. This one happens to be the bottom one I showed you, the 161. It happens to be for, I believe, SNMP. Now, if I try a full connect scan, it will work. Or well, at least I hope it will work. Let's actually test that. Now, the way NMAP, you can get a version of NMAP for Windows, but why bother? There's certain other things that Microsoft supposedly done that the throttle back connections and makes NMAP a little slower, my understanding, on Windows. So just use a Linux boot CD or your dedicated Linux box. The way, but anyway, the way NMAP does it, if you happen to use NMAP on Windows, it uses raw Ethernet. So while Microsoft cut them out from using raw sockets, doing TCP connections, the guys from NMAP just went down an extra layer, went down to raw Ethernet, and shut the packets they wanted anyway. The one downside of this is if you use the raw Ethernet, you can't do stuff like uh, do packet scans across modems. And I'm guessing token means probably screwed up in a few other networking topologies. And as you see, it gave me a lot of results with different ports. And if I click view HTML results, it gives me a nice little report. Do we have any questions so far? Okay, in that case, we shall continue. Well, we go with every key is not open. Superscan is freeware. Superscan, everything I'm showing is freeware. I am a very cheap, cheap bastard. <laughs> I have no budget. I use pretty much everything open source or freeware. Angry IP is open source. Superscan is free. Also, uh, Foundstone puts out a lot of great free tools. I recommend checking them out. They have a really cool one for um, scanning a site using Google to find possible vulnerable CGI's on their web pages. And I can't remember the name of it precisely, it's, it's using Google's cache. You never leave a log <laughs> on the site. You leave one with Google, but I mean, Google's logs have to be freaking huge. They're never going to look through those. Or maybe. <laughs> 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 For the record, I am not a black hat. I have a footage on plaid hat. The next one we'll show is InMap and ScanRan. InMap is my favorite scanner. It's got everything in the kitchen sink built into it. If I can get to it. Here's my uh, friendly Linux box over my security lab. We'll sit down for just a second. Okay, let's say I want to use nmap. Let's do a basic nmap of a host. Like uh, 192.168. Dot one dot one oh one. And I think this is my Linux box there. Yeah, it is. All I did was do a basic TCP scan, and if I remember right, NMAP's default is like the first uh, 1,024 ports plus a bunch of other common ports above that. But those are the ports of most common ports it found. If I use a dash p parameter, I can specify individual ports. But most of the ports I'm going to be looking for <coughs> will probably be in that default range. That just tells me what ports are open. Also, I can do a scan, UDP, scan, send scan. By default, if you're running this route, NMAP does a send scan. 
However, you can statically, or you can explicitly say do a TCP full connect scan with a dash S uppercase T. But let me use the UDP and the SIN. Hard to believe I don't have any UDP ports open, so it's the same. Unless, of course, I use the wrong flag. IMAP has tons and tons of flags. If you watch the Shockwave Flash tutorials I have, you'll figure that one out. But let me take out these. Actually, I'll leave those in, and I want to specify a couple other things. I'm going to specify a dash O for operating system detection, and a dash S of the case V for version detection. All right. The way OS, X, OS detection works is it sends different types of packets with different flags set, and depending on what respond, the response is, you might have a good idea of what operating system is running on that box. Uh, different operating systems respond in different ways. There are certain standards in TCP, but some things aren't really well defined, and so different vendors like Microsoft, or the guys who make Linux, or the guys who make FreeBSD, or OS X, sorry, OS X, one of my buddies chastised that a little while ago, uh, they might respond to different, different packets. As you can see, this guessed that it's a Linux box running one of the 2.4, 2.5, or 2.6 kernels. And as I recall, its guess is pretty close to correct. I want to say it's like 2.6.11. Also, you notice different ports? This gives me a little information about which particular VNC is running on there and which particular protocol version of VNC is running on that port. That's because of that SV. If I want to do that quickly, instead of using the dash upcase O, dash S upcase V, I could just do a dash upcase A. Yes, there is a GUI front end for NMAP. However, it's always going to trail behind the command line version because there's certain flags you can't instantly give it if you use the GUI version. However, if you use the command line version, you can access them all. If you want to learn more about NMAP, besides looking at the various tutorials I've mentioned, uh, just do a man space NMAP, and you'll get a help page on it. Let me uh, scan a different box. I think, actually, let me scan an IP range. Let me scan 200 and, uh, 56 hosts, because I believe in that doesn't skip out on zero and uh, 255 when it doesn't scan. By the way, is this readable up here? Good question. Why does your um, graphics server have a good jump port open? Is that part of VNC? Hmm? X11 or 6001? Uh, in that case, I want to say that particular port is because it is running X server on that machine. And I'm scanning it from the local machine, yeah. so it's possible even okay. it, it might be restricted, it's not restricted in this particular case, because it sees that I'm coming from the local host. Yeah, X11 is not something you think of communicating over the internet or a network. No, it's not something you want. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people used to do like the X host plus, so that anybody could send any kind of client to them. And people think that's okay, but you can actually log keys that way. If someone uses like X host space plus by itself, there's actually programs you can use to send a client to them, but since you have a client on the, on the workstation, all right, for those who don't know X, the server's running on your, on your, on your machine, and the client's actually running on the server. It's confused. But um, there's actually ways of like sending a key over to somebody if they did that. Okay, it's found a few hosts. <clears throat> One of them up here, it gave me the MAC address, it gave me the particular version, of the service running on there, and this one's guest is running Microsoft Windows 2003, or possibly one of these other variants. And since I know my network over there, that to be true. You see this response filtered? That's because more than likely this particular port did send back any response, <coughs> so it could be open, it could be filtered. You don't really know. Now, I was going to do a speed comparison between NMAP and let's say ScanRAN. I'm going to use the time command, NMAP. And to be fair, well, actually, I'm not being completely fair because, quite frankly, it's also the tweaks you can do with NMAP too as far as timings to make it much, much faster. I'm going to scan ports 1 through uh, 1020, and I'm going to scan <coughs> close 
192.168.1.100.200. This is the way I specified it in that. And I think I got all that in right. By the way, uh, using version detection and OS detection does slow things down because it has to send more packets. This is actually a flag you use for verbose mode, so you can see exactly what packets in that is sending. But speed test has decided to turn that off. As you can see, those uh, 100 hosts, it took about 17 seconds. Now, you scan ran, which I mentioned earlier, as being much, much faster. Do the same hosts. Here I'm specifying what IP address range, what port range, and also how long to wait for no response. I'm going to change that instead, though, I think, to just one second. Only took a little over five seconds. That's because it did everything stateless. Any questions so far about InMap or ScanRan? So, okay. Actually, let me show a few other things in InMap. I'm trying to remember what all I have here to show. Different flags. I assume all just the basics. I pretty much showed those. Wild card listing. Then let me switch to the the other one. Different outputs you can give, make him app do, like you can put out a graphical log file, an XML file, which you can then bring up in a web browser and get a pretty view of, or import to something else, like an access database, or a, imagine you have things for importing XML files into my SQL, <coughs> SQL. Different types of scans you can do. Since some, some scans will get through with others won't, the SIN scan is the most common one, but some people use FIN scans because someone may not be rec rec <coughs> not recognizing that's coming through. Like, certain non stateful firewalls, if they see a SIN packet come in, they'll go, no, can't have that. However, if they see something like an ACK packet come in or a FIN packet come in, they'll go, okay, maybe someone internally already tried to set up a session with them, so I'll let it through. Stateful firewalls, however, will still block that. X scan, as in all letters, like an X machine. Some boxes will respond kind of weird if you have a uh, fan urge and the push flags all on at the same time. Null scan is a similar concept, so we have none of the flags set beyond. That's just showing them. Actually, in this case, uh, this is going to be a fin scan. And I want to say at some point in time in this video, yes. <coughs> Right here, this is the log you'll find in Windows Firewall. If you go, if you turn on the firewall and you turn on logging on your control panel, this is on your Windows, pfirewall.log by default. Here's the information about what kind of packets have been coming in and have been dropped or accepted, depending on what you choose to log. It lists the IPs that are coming from and what they're going to, what particular port they're trying to connect to, and what flags were set. For instance, right here, you see just the fin flag was set. Here, the fin, the urgent, and the uh, push flags were set. What's that? I believe you're correct, yes. Packet trace is one of the things I was telling you about earlier to want to find more information about what's being sent by in that. <clears throat> oh, idle scans. Uh, you know how uh, there's a, a sequence number in IP connections? Well, if something has a sequential or very predictable IP sequence, you can actually sort of bounce a scan off another of machine. Now you can't use this scan with other things like OS detection because that's going to have to actually get a real connection to the other machine. But if you use an idle scan, you can actually make it fake it out as if you're scanning at someone else. The way an idle scan works is basically you talk to the machine, find out what its current 
sequence ID is at. Then you send a message to your machine spoofed as your zombie. And then you ch it will send a message back to the zombie depending on what the port's open. And then whether or not that port's open, the sequence ID is going to get updated on the zombie. And then when you probe it again, you'll find out whether that port's open. Don't worry if that's really confusing. It takes a while to figure that one out. Watch that video sometime, you'll get more details. But the punchline is, when you actually do it, and you look in the firewall log, I use the Objective X box because it has an easy to predict sequence. Okay, if you actually look at the firewall log later on, and I don't know if I can illustrate this because I'm not sure where in this video it is, but you'll actually see that it was faked out and the machine that was actually doing the scanning doesn't show up in the log, but the scan machine that you were bouncing the scan off of does. Does that make sense? <coughs> Someone else gets the blame. Someone else gets the blame. Also, you can do stuff like decoys. For instance, uh, if you wanted to, in that, you use decoy scans to send a whole bunch of packets and list a bunch of other people that you want to send as. Like here, I think I sent as Microsoft.com and a few other hosts. Um, basically, that makes it harder for the, the system administrator to figure out who's actually doing the attack because you see so many different people trying to connect to them. The one downside to using decoys, if you use something like a OS detection or version detection, since you have to do a free handshake, the system administrator can find that still by seeing which one's just connected or which one just sent packets and which one's actually did the full connection. The one that they had most traffic with, that actually had the freeway connection to find out what, what, what version of the service that is or what OS it is, it's going to leave a lot bigger set of uh, records in the log. Does that make sense? Back to the zombie PC. What if the zombie PC communicates with, say, other systems on the network before you hear back from it? Then you, you have a problem. An ideal zombie, you have to have a predictable IP sequence. And it has to see very low traffic. <clears throat> That's why, in this particular example, I use the Jet Direct box. Because the only time it's going to receive traffic pretty much that's destined for it is uh, when someone's trying to print to it. So. It's iffy. It's iffy. You're all correct. It is iffy. That's no problem with zombie scans. And also slow as hell. And there's a few tutorials that are useful for getting more information. Now you might want to know how to find out what ports are open on your own box. If you're using Windows, now you can of course scan yourself in that. <coughs> uh, and that's usually a good idea because if someone is choking the hell out of your box, these tools may or may not give you real results. However, I'm going to use them for this example. I'm going to jump up to a command line here in Windows. Netstat-B, older versions of uh, Windows before XP, Netstat doesn't necessarily tell you the EXE that's opening that port. You'd have to use something like F-Port. But uh, right here you can see that Firefox on this machine has established a connection. There's the PID, there's the phone address, so on and so forth. So you can actually see which ports open by what binaries on your machine. Yeah, remote desktop doesn't show up there. 3389? Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. Yeah. I just a lot of services are all built into a SVC host yeah. in Windows. A ton of them. And oh, that's right, I got you. Now I switch to my Linux box.
I'll give you an idea of what ports are open. I don't think I did that right, though. <coughs> no? Here I wrote down. Now I'm trying to remember what exactly the command is. I want more information than just that. But at least you can find what ports are listening on the box, assuming that uh, LSUV is a Trojan. Some people, when they compromise the box, part of the root kit, they'll change the binary so it doesn't report their activities. In cases like that, and even in other cases, it's useful to use a third-party site to see whether or not anybody's, uh, any ports have been opened on your machine. And to illustrate that, I list these two websites, Shields Up and Sidegate Scan. I'm going to show off Sidegate Scan here in just a moment. Assuming I can look them up. If you do an in-map scan from your, on your own network, or if you use one of the command line tools just to find out what ports the operating system things are open, you'll get different results than you will if someone externally tries to scan you. For instance, since here on campus we have different firewalls between us and the internet, it's going to say more ports are open if you scan from on the network than it will if you scan from outside the network. So. I'm going to pull the scan from outside the network. To do that, I'm going to use SysGate, SciGate, I mean. Use a quick scan. So let's go ahead and start the scan. And if I look at my logs, the IP address of one of the web servers or one of the servers in general will wind up in my logs. It lists me different ports, what's closed and what's not. What's blocked, when it says blocked, it probably means it didn't get back any response. That should be equivalent to uh, filtered. Service message block protocol, which is more or less just in this uh, Windows file sharing, you notice that all campus firewalls block that for good reason. Same thing goes with universal plug and play. It does complain because if someone tries to ping us, it will respond to a ping. But I can at least give you an idea of what ports are reachable from outside. And if you wanted to, you could do a more in-depth scan. <coughs> and a couple of different options, like scanning for common Trojans, like if it sees the leak port open, it figures something is up. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Well, in that case, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, don't forget to check out the handouts and the various links I put on there. I'm hoping to have the recording of this on a future Informaticon TV episode. And uh, if you're interested in computer security, one of the web pages I have listed on there is uh, Hack Louisville, which you might be interested in. They're working on having like monthly meetings and so forth, kind of like 2600. Hackers have a forum system, and if you want to speak up with other people who have an interest in this sort of thing, it'd be a good place to go. Well, if there's no questions, then I'm going to shut this down down. Thank you. Well, you didn't talk about snoring. Oh, yes, I totally forgot about this. <coughs> Throw a different... Um... Start all back up. <laughs> Start all back up. Go a few different countermeasures to use against people who try to port scan you. Uh, one of them I'd like to mention is SNORT, which is a general intrusion detection system that gives you an idea of uh, what things are going on on your network, coming in, going out, and so forth. One problem is you kind of got to fine tune it because it gives you huge logs of everything that's happening. And it ends up being rather noisy and people ignore it because it gives them so many, so many reports. Some other ones I listed here. I list scan log D, which is basically just for finding uh, people who are port scanning you and logs in, logging the information. And port sentry. Port sentry, I have many one of my boxes here. It's pretty cool. You can actually write scripts for it to do things whenever it detects a port scan happening to that box. So in theory, you could counter hack somebody, but it's not highly recommended. However, it might be useful to at least 
do a scan back and find out if that attachment box is running something like Nessus or some other security tools. It might give you an idea of who you're dealing with. Uh, and there's <coughs> nice logs that you can go in and look at later on and find out who's been port scanning yet. Thanks for reminding me about that. I didn't see it in my uh, slide presentation, so I forgot about it. Anything else? Well, in that case, thank you very much. If you want to go ahead and continue, I'm just going to work on shutting all this down. Thanks for coming by, Ray. Thanks, David. Want to go porch dance with people? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, a lot. Depends on what I'm doing. If I'm doing this general, I want to see what's going on in the network. Yes, e is great. Uh, Driftnet's awesome if you just want to see what people are web surfing. Uh, DSniff and EDOCAP are awesome if you want to do um, op spoofing so you can actually sniff around a switch by op poisoning two different hosts on the network and try and traffic through you and then using DSniff or uh, EDOCAP to actually pass out passwords or other information. EDOCAP is real cool because uh, you can write your own filters for it to do extra things like uh, you see all the images coming through, you replace them with your own image. I'll let your imagination run wild with that. <laughs> I actually have a script up on my webpage to demonstrate doing image replacement. Okay. But for just general purpose sniffing, yeah, e is what I use. So, you don't have your notebook. Uh, yeah, I do, but Ethereal is on Linux, and I haven't got my wireless configured on there yet. There is a Windows version. I haven't got it yet. Okay. Isn't Ethereal what um, they were showing the last time we had a presentation? I've got that downloaded on my laptop. It is an awesome piece of software. Would you uh, want to show it in action? Uh, yeah, I'll ask Windows. Let me go ahead and... Maybe an instant web server for goodbye. Let this thing save. I'm using a program called Cam Studio to actually capture all of this demonstration so I can easily include it in the corner of the uh, video when it's done. And right now it's saving out probably like a, oh, probably a huge file, probably about a 45 minute file. So this would be like 500 megs. But in the meantime, what that's doing is saying, oh, another sniffer, Kane. As far as sniffing uh, passwords off the network for Windows, Kane is awesome. Actually, it's the one Windows tool I really wish they'd port to Linux. Uh, it does the art poise, it does a bunch of other things as far as cracking local passwords. Like, it's a great replacement it's if you don't want to buy a lot of crap. Was that? It's got a huge dictionary file. And it's awesome. But I recommend ch checking out Kane sometime. All right, let me close that down, close this down, and we'll fire up E for real. Is that it's only? Exploit this dictionary anytime? Oh no, you no, can do brute force, you can do tons of things. Okay. It just starts with a dictionary and goes from there. I show a few things on the website if you're using Kane, but Kane would be several presentations by itself. Gotcha. <laughs> Alright, here's E for real. Here's different interfaces I have on my machine. Oh, you're not, uh... oh good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> happens to me too. I turned, I turned it off. <laughs> you want to fire up your... Uh, I'll be an interesting web surfer. Yeah, that way we can uh, show a little traffic here, or be guaranteed of some traffic anyway. <laughs> Probably somebody in the technology is... Which is going to come on. Let me see if this thing is still recording. It may very well have stopped. Oh, well, look cool. You're wondering why I'm wearing this t-shirt. One of my buddies at Threepnit. Guy goes by the name Doss Man. Show on mine called packet snippers, and I said I'd wear this the next time I actually did a video. Mm -hmm. Okay, is this going to come on? I saw some photos of uh, Freaknik there on the website. Yeah. Good times. Okay, here we are. Happily, not even capturing packets yet, but just seeing what we can see. You'll notice it only sees things on my wired card, on my uh, 10, 10 100 card. Reason for this is I happen to have this Neutrino chipset, which means I'm using the IPW 
2,200 drivers or windows which do not, as of yet, support, support promiscuous mode. I cannot put my uh, network card into slutty mode. So it's only seeing packets destined for it. So to illustrate things, I'm going to capture packets on the wired network instead. If you have the newest Linux drivers, they do support promiscuous mode on uh, the newest Centrino. I got a prison too called just in case for those kind of uh, events. Sorry about the crudeness of the lecture, I'm not used to giving, being up and speaking to people. Unless it's like already can. Alright, I'm capturing some packets and let me stop. Let's see some of the things we got. Close that down. You see some off packets going across the network. Basically, people are just trying to figure out what MAC address goes with what IP address. Spanning tree, which is for routers figuring out which way to send packets. Uh, a name query for NetBIOS, trying to figure out what machine on a Windows network to connect to. <coughs> well, not necessarily Windows, but usually we think Windows. I mean, there could be Samba on a Windows box, on a Linux box, or a Land Manager, or a host of little things. Let's see. DNS, someone's trying to resolve a name to an IP address. If I was to look at this a little further, see what I can actually figure out. It ha because it has such a low resolution, this isn't looking great. I see a DNS that I use there. Mm -hmm. More than likely, that's the one they were trying to resolve. And someone that packages information about what IP address. Or actually, no. This could just be the query part. But you can look at look at different parts. It's like you just want to see Ethernet part. <coughs> you can see it up here. Just see the IP part. And you see it shows you from what IP address to what IP address. And somewhere in here, it should right down here, list port. In this case, it, I imagine it has to be a response because the destination's port is not 53. And 53 is the port you talk to when you talk to a DNS server. If you see a lot of traffic going across your network, you have a packet storm, you're trying to figure out what it is, this is one way. Like, for instance, if you see like a, a metric buttload of um, uh, ICP echo, going across it, someone might, be, someone might be doing a stuff attack, which is where they fake ICMP echo request to an entire network, and then use it as a bouncer to bounce all the traffic at someone else. For instance, you know, you continue one Microsoft servers, you send a message here using the broadcast uh, ping address, then all the machines here respond back to Microsoft. And, well, in Microsoft's case, it wouldn't take them off the network, but if it was like a smaller company, it would. Here we see a few TCP, TCP IP uh, packets. I'm not sure what particular protocol for sure. Somewhere here that might be some uh, web traffic. I don't see any right here now, though. HTTP? Yeah. I don't see any you can sort of in there. What's that? You can sort of protocol. I'll go ahead and do that. Hmm. Cups, which is a printing protocol. Printing service. <laughs> That's all. But actually, if I was to do a scan like that, let's see. We actually generate some. Got saving. Open some web traffic. Okay. Hopefully, in theory, since I'm using SSL, this particular connection will not appear, but it appears something that's encrypted. Okay. There we go. And we actually bothered to scroll through all that. We 
the seats in the traffic. If it's going to port uh, 1443, it's probably the SSL encrypted web traffic. Let me right click on one of these and say follow TCP stream. And here you see the request information coming from the client. And here you see uh, the response back from that particular server. And you can tell the server's in Apache box. That might have been my connection to. Someone else should be my connection to my server on campus, but I'd have to scroll through to look. And there's all sorts of filters you can apply, like if I wanted to apply a filter right here. I can say expression. <coughs> you can type it in by hand, but you can go in here and uh, create yourself a filter so if you like only want to view a certain IP address. Okay, it's been a while since I use this functionality. Is it listen to the post or IP address? IP. Sorry, this didn't come up better. There's so many options here. Let's see. Actually, I think I can probably. IP address equals. And let's see if I can take all this out. And I happen to know one of the machines I talked to was 149.160.32. And that's all my traffic encrypted to Tux, which is one of the boxes I brought up. Yeah. But I can create a filter in that way, either using the expression builder or just by typing it in and filter out just some types of packets. Like I can filter by port, protocol, all sorts of different things. You can actually use uh, E for real. If you want to sniff a print job and replay it, you can actually use it to sit there, sniff what's going to like port 9100, grab all that data, follow the stream, cut out just the parts you want, get the raw postscript or PCL, then replay it to your own printer later on. And no one thinks about printer security. So there's all sorts of information that uh, printers can possibly need. Uh, not that using web. Not that using wireless. Not, not that they're using wireless. Oh. Because unfortunately, the particular chips that I have in here does not support mysteries mode. Oh. Now, if I toss, actually change that, I can. I think I have a Prism 2 based card in here. Actually, are we running late here? How much do we have to I think I have a Prism 2 card in here, in which case, we're good. I'm sure I have installed this before. See, Windows wants a specific driver for it. Can I install this? Um, unfortunately, I guess I can't show it. I thought I'd install the drivers for this one, but apparently I am incorrect. So, no, but if you like, like a coffee shop and so, or so forth, mm -hmm. you can sit there and sniff the connections. Mm -hmm. and see what people are doing and all sorts of people use insecure protocols like uh, let's say pop free without encryption. Uh, 
part, there is a version of part three that I think that uses SSL for encryption. People use using Telnet, which is less common nowadays. Most people switch to secure shells. They don't bother to use that at all. SN, SN, SMTP and SN, SNMP for that matter. If, unless you're using the S, if you're using SNMP, some of the open management protocol before version three, that passes its a uh, community strain plain text across the network. Um, but yeah, SNMP. It's S. This is why I don't give presentations more often. <laughs> SMTP is a common one that passes its password insecurely. You can just sniff out there. Oh, regular HTTP. All it does is uh, basically forward codes the password and sends it across, mm -hmm. and that's a reversible algorithm. You just reverse it the other way. Generally, don't trust the site unless it's using SSL. Which is just uh, the secure socket layer, uh, which encrypts the information. Also, there's a few other protocols like TLS. I want to say TLS is synonymous with SSL3, but I'm not 100% sure on that. That's definitely something you can probably have a better look up instead of just trusting me on it. I don't know everything. I know very little. I just enjoy studying it a whole lot. Thank you very much, Socrates. So great. So great. So great. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's us. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody here also take philosophy courses? If you ever decide to go into AI, it might be useful. Because then you can at least you know, rationalize, yeah, I created something that was intelligent. Really, I did. By this definition. Trying <laughs> to think if there's anything else I should show while I'm here. A lot of my tools are going to be in the next space, so they're over. I'm not even sure if I can pass a Turing test. Mm. Depends on what questions we ask you about. <laughs>